Welcome to 99 Grid. We are live. It is our vision here to inspire you to chase your dreams and turn those dreams into tangible design careers through learning new design skills and being accountable in that pursuit. Welcome, everyone. It is another Monday. We are a little bit late into the event. There's been some technical difficulties we've been struggling with lately, but we have overcame those with vigor and with uh, a marvelous success. So welcome, everyone. Uh, it is our Facebook Live event. It takes time um, every Monday at 10 a.m. CET. Today, we're a little bit late into it, as I said. But without further ado, let's get this thing started. User experience design. We've covered what it is, how it's structured. So we've covered the, the technological aspects of what UX is, so the screen resolutions and all those elements. Then we went into information architecture, how to organize the information uh, within your app system process, whatever you want to call that. Then information design, how to present it best. Then uh, interaction design, how to create an interaction interaction for the user with that information that's now you know very cohesively presented to them. And then, yeah, usability engineering or usability testing or user testing, whatever you want to call that, basically testing that whole concept of interaction with an actual human being, then synthesizing that information, uh, using some of the UI um, elements, so like graphic design, visual aspects of this whole madness. And um, yeah, and then finishing up with copywriting. So, but that only tells us what your user experience is. It doesn't really tell us, okay, so how do we actually do it? So today I wanted to cover that specific aspect. So how do we get into um, yeah, user experience as a process. How do we look at it? What are the elements of that uh, specific thing and how to tackle it? So I'm going to spend the next probably like half an hour, maybe an hour. We'll see how, how far we can take this you know, so I can actually showcase what user experience design process looks like. So without further ado, I've got some crazy notes here, you know, so I'm just going to uh, cover like one by one without too much detail. So First, on the Zoom, are you ready to start this thing? Awesome. And let's go with the screen. And yeah, DJ. Let's do this. Let's bloody do this. So I'm just having fun with my new Ecamm Live software. It's pretty cool. So uh, breaking this whole thing down, I'm going to kind of give it to you in, in, in phases, if you like, and then we'll highlight uh, what, what it all means. So to start off, let's see if I'm perfect. So. It all starts, uh, there's a few things when it comes to the entire process. I'm going to show you all the way from the very beginning, how to build a UX strategy, all the way to the kind of finished product and how it all kind of unfolds. So to me, the strategy is the, is, is the first kind of element of, of the process itself. So UX strategy. Right, and we will do that. We will cover that in a little bit of a kind of a border. So this is where we kind of strategize. We think about the stakeholder mapping, the, the, the business goals, the outcome we're trying to achieve, what is our design vision, um, uh, you know, what our competitors are doing in this field, um, elements related to how do we put this digital product and that specific interaction within a broader sense of things. So that's UX strategy. And that's the first kind of uh, element of getting into this whole thing. Now let me just uh, try and just do a, a quick erase. I just want it to be a little bit nicer for you guys. So just bear with me. And a uh, and a brush. There we go. So UX strategy. So that's the first thing. I'll break it down what it all means. Uh, actually, I'll do it now. So I'm going to use a different color. So that's UX strategy. And then we'll go maybe with a, with a blue one. So the first step into this whole thing is... Um, is a kind of def definition of the constraints. So that's something that um, I, I like to call creative creative constraints. I'm going to go with a second line of text, creative, and I'm actually going to lower the, the size of the brush a little bit. So creative constraints. So these are all the elements that we've talked about in the technological aspect of what UX user experience design is, so what UX design actually is. And, and all the technological aspects kind of fit into this thing because they limit us with some, you know, the, I call them creative constraints because they limit us as designers, but we need to creatively solve those constraints and kind of, you know, be on top of them in, in some way, shape or form. So that's, uh, that's one thing. So creative constraints is, is, is definitely one of those things. 
And I'll kind of, at the end of this whole process, so wait up, uh, up until the end, I'll kind of match those two together. So what UX is and how the process looks like and when all of, where all of those kind of elements of what UX is actually fit into the process. So I'll go back to, to, to each one of those. So creative constraints, that's where we look at what constraints us as a designer uh, within, you know, the strategy, the IT uh, kind of hardware and software elements and all of those um, ins and outs of what we need to actually find out at the very beginning of the project so that we know what are the kind of limitations that we need to fit our design into. So that's the first thing. Then we go into something that I kind of, I, I feel sometimes business, that this is all I talk about lately. You know, it's like business goals, business goals, business goals. Andy is all about business. Well, not really, but um, um, it is important aspect of, of, of our work. You know, we need to fulfill an outcome. We need to fulfill a need of a business to, you know, so that somebody recruits us, you know, and kind of trusts us that we can deliver something uh, that brings value to, to the end customer, you know, and then that person stays with that business or with that service provider for a longer period of time, for example, as a business uh, goal, et cetera, goes. So, so, that's, so that's one thing. So business goals, once we know what are the creative limitations that we need to fit our design into, so that's step number one, we can then, since we know what the constraints are, we can then still define, okay, so if this is something we need to fit our design into, what is the outcome that we're trying to achieve? And that all, all that sits in the business goals. Once we've done that, then we go into stakeholders. Stakeholders. And that's a whole list. And I'm just going to go stakeholders mapping. Mapping. And that's the element that I would call where we really start to look into the kind of the, the shoes of the customer. So we want to kind of uh, see if this is the limitations and this is the outcome that we're trying to achieve, what is the biggest impact stakeholder on our way to get to that outcome? And usually those are end users, end customers, uh, but not always. So, so sometimes these people kind of tend to be, um, you know, organizations or people that are, you know, outside of the field of our design work or the impact we're trying to have. It's not just the app, it's, you know, a B2B um, entity that we need to kind of, uh, consider in our design process to actually meet that specific business goal. So, so that's the stakeholder uh, mapping, and then going from uh, from that, you know, we are not that we're not too far. Once we've defined the, the the constraint, the business goal, the stakeholders, then we go into kind of what do we have for those people um, as a value proposition to to attract them to whatever product we're actually building. So that's the value proposition. So this is something that's pretty relevant. So once you do define what your constraints are, who your biggest impact stakeholder is, those stakeholders, they have needs, unfulfilled, they have some problems. And our value proposition is here to actually help them out, solve their issues, and kind of help them out along the way. <clears throat> so that's that. Once we have the value proposition, then we're ready to put something we call very drastically, again, the business. Uh, it's called the business model. And then there's a canvas that we use usually, but let's just build a business model. On the backbone of that value proposition, we can now come up with a meaningful way of structuring that information into something that shows us how the business is going to actually be working in the context of that, uh, you know, app or that system or that software solution or any interaction that we're trying to have between the product and the end user or the end customers for, for that matter. So, so that's that when it comes to the business model. And... Um, that pretty much is it when it comes to how how we kind of define what UX strategy is. It all is being summarized with, with some sort of a synthesis that we can actually go back and rework the strategy consistently, but it answers all of the crucial questions. It says, okay, we have an idea for a digital product. That's great. Uh, going back from that, how is it going to work or kind of fit into your business environment and what kind of value proposition this product actually brings to the table? For whom, who's the end customer, end user, etc. What kind of business goal are we trying to achieve? And what are the limitations we as designers need to put uh, that entire design context into? And that kind of summarizes the UX strategy. And it's a good conversation to have at the very beginning of the project so that we fully understand what is the outcome of this whole thing. Uh, there are projects that, that you know, I'm being sometimes invited to that really are uh, on the on the you know at the, at the very end of this spectrum or even kind of in the middle of the process so somebody has an idea for an app 
and they just want uh, us to design it. And I always ask those questions going back from, okay, you want us to design an app and then yeah, go back from, from that idea to, to actually figuring out what is the expected outcome and who is it for. So that's, that's a kind of step number one. And that's going to be our UX strategy thing. So moving on to the next step, and I'm actually going to maybe do a little bit. So once we have that stakeholder and we know what the value proposition is and what the business model is all around that, we can like take all of that information and actually bring it to the next step. And the next step to me is UX research. Research. Right? Maybe I'll be able to kind of see that's the thing with with this Photoshop, but if I do uh, put the the shift on and the shift key on, and actually this is something that I don't really like. And there you go. So that's UX research, and it's all this specific step is very crucial because all it does is valid is it validates all of the things that we've actually talked about in the ux strategy stage of the process so we want to early on kind of figure out okay so if this is the stakeholder what is the actual um customer or end user behind that stakeholder group uh and let's sit down and talk to those people as soon uh, as possible so so the things that um that, that 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 i usually try to get at this stage in time is the, the first thing I'm trying to do, to do is create a recruitment meant profile. I want to talk to some real people. So have, I have a, a vaguely described stakeholder, so something that I've got here, right? So I've got the stakeholder mapping. I know who that stakeholder is. But what I'm actually missing is, you know, a more tangible outlook. And I usually do that at the stakeholder mapping exercise. We have a deck of cards somewhere around here. And we're using that deck of cards to kind of transition from a vaguely described stakeholder into something that's more tangible. And we call that a design archetype. And we take that archetype and we create a recruitment profile. So that's a real human being that has a specific age, uh, you know, family structure, lives somewhere, works somewhere, has some level of education, etc. And we try to recruit those people using a recruitment agency or, you know, any other means necessary to actually get this, get, you know, get in touch with, a real human being on the other side of the, uh, of the of the spectrum. So let me just maybe try to do something like this. Maybe this will work better. There you go. That's more. Um, yeah, these lines are not as wiggly. I'm actually looking at this. I need to get rid of this guy. Really, I need to make this. I'm compulsive this way a little bit, and I just can't look at this the way that it uh, looks now. So just grab yourself something to um, to drink. I'm gonna take a little bit of uh, time just to clean this bad boy off. So um, I hope that everybody's well, happy, dandy, safe, healthy, you know, with all this Corona madness. I hope that it will be over, you know, sooner rather than later. I'm really glad that they kind of, um, they got rid of the whole lockdown restrictions lately, which is really cool to see. You know, I was able to, we were able to get out there, you know, into the outskirts of, yeah, off the town, spend some time in the nature side of things, which is really cool to do. All right, moving on, man, it's, that laptop is really giving me some hard time here when it comes to temperature, but we will struggle on whatever happens. So the business goes, then we have, I don't know if it's gonna be better, I hope it will be, it will be at least even-ish. So we have the value prop and we have the business model. So yeah, kind of, kind of there. So uh, when it comes to the recruitment profile, that's pretty much what we get from the stakeholder mapping, the archetype, and then we start to put it into a recruitment profile. So something that we can then put into a into work and really talk to some uh, real uh, human, um, yeah, human beings. So so that's that. And in order for us to do that, we recruit those people, and we have some questions to uh, to ask, right? So we create these uh, so-called Research. I never know if, if, if it's research or is it research? I don't know. Let me know in the comments if you can help me out with that. Uh, research scenarios. Research scenario is nothing more than a list of questions 
that we need to ask our recipients to validate whatever we want to validate as far as value proposition is concerned, the business model that we're trying to build here with this app or with this solution. And we built a, you know, a, list of, a whole list of questions to make sure that we actually respond to that. And all we need to do once we have those questions lined up is pick the right method for, you know, for that research. I don't want to get into details about, you know, in-depth interviews or online questionnaires or what that is. Uh, but these are basically tools and methods of research specialists to validate any, um, yeah, any hypothesis, any questions we might have. We can get to the answers of using that. So all we need to do now is just do our user research. user research there you go so we validate a lot of the concepts a lot of the value propositions here and all we need to do is just yeah take that and uh, using you know various methods i'm just looking at my notes here so i don't forget anything we need to synthesize it into something um and the the best synthesis i find at this specific moment in time is a design persona so i'm kind of design persona I'm not a huge believer in the method itself. I mean, in the, in the tool, a design persona is pretty much an, org an aggregate of, um, of our recipient data. So it's a presentation or a communication tool so that we can aggregate a lot of recip recipients or a lot of responses to the questions of the people that we've interviewed uh, into, into one design persona. So what I'm a huge um, advocate of is, is to synthesize the research into this form. But what I'm a huge, uh, what I'm against is when it comes to using a design persona very early on where we don't have any insight from a real human being. So we just sit down at a meeting with some business people around the table and then we come up with a design persona because we're empathizing with our customers. I'm, I know that it works to an extent when you're kind of empathizing with people. Um, uh, you're trying to imagine, you know, what that customer of yours feels like and, you know, why they act a certain way. But I prefer to have some real tangible data behind that specific design persona. So some real responses or some real human, you know, <laughs> human being, some real people. And um, that's what I'm trying to get to as soon as possible. So I do the research, then we do a design persona. So we create that document um, and kind of a representation of that specific aggregate. And that kind of forms the, um, the synthesis. And there's a lot of problems and needs unfulfilled within that design persona. That's the aggregation element for me. That's the main axis of that aggregation. So is that something that um, that a person actually needs that we're not giving them or, or they're not getting somewhere else? So that's why our product is relevant to them. Or are we solving any problems that they might have? So the design persona is there to help us out with that. And then once we have a whole list of problems and unfulfilled needs, we can then go to something which is the next step in the process. And that's something that I call UX modeling, UX modeling, modeling. So we create a UX model uh, out of, yeah, out of the designs, and I mean, out of the problems and the needs of that specific design persona. So we know that there are some people that have some problems and we're trying to fix them. So the first uh, thing we do at this stage in the process is ideate. So we come up with as many potential ideas that are able to actually fulfill the needs or solve their problems as we can. So we generate, you know, north of two, three, five hundred ideas uh, and then try to, yeah, put them, cluster them together and, and kind of use the best ones we've generated in this specific uh, moment. And then once we've ideated and we have a lot of cool ideas, then we need to structure them into something that's tangible. And since we are in the user experience field of work, uh, we're not kind of in the, in the more broader design thinking, which we're covering as well as you probably know, uh, because we're here, the first element that, that, that we put together here is the information architecture. So, so we have a lot of ideas. I think this is the, the blue one. And that's one way, a great way, information architecture. to organize that information here. So you have a lot of ideas and all of those ideas come, come with a certain amount of information, data, features, you know, elements that are gonna be really interesting to the user. And we need to, you know, 
take all of those ideas, take all of that data, all of those features, and organize them in a certain way. So that's where we really start into uh, to, to create something, you know, a, a model of of what that user experience is going actually to uh, is going to look like as far as the chunks of data, chunks of information that we're going to be are, that are going to be made available to the user uh, to, the, to, to the user base or to the users themselves, right? So that's information architecture. And one cool artifact is something that mm, that we call a wire flow. And that's a very uh, very easy schematic of um, of how that information is is, is presented um, to, to to the user. So it's kind of you know building little blocks of information. What is the kind of the, the structure of this entire interface? How it's going to work? You know there are some elements over there. You can click around, but it's very very kind of high level. You know it's like it's not an interaction model. It's just showing us how the structure of information is going to be placed around this entire app system whatever we uh, whatever we're designing so it's very high level it doesn't have a lot of detail it's just strategically placing the right context of information in the right spots so that's pretty much uh, what that what that is and um yeah let's move on to the next one so that's that and that's what i would call ux modeling and then when we have the model, the wire flow um, ready, where is that? Uh, the wire flow ready, we can then go into UX design. So that's kind of UX design is really on top of all of that, but I'm going to use that uh, UX design terminology uh, over here, UX design, because this is where we're really getting our, our hands dirty and we're really getting into the actual design itself let me just i think that these boxes are getting smaller and smaller the further i go which is kind of odd so let's just move that a little bit to the side there we go man i haven't used photoshop in a while uh because i'm using adobe xd now which is a cool package for ux designers i'd highly recommend it but um best regards to jay who's i think still involved in this whole thing um and big shout out so UX design and there's quite a few things here to, to to cover and a lot of the projects kind of start here you know they're like yeah design an app give us some interface designs and you know let's get this done and without all of these previous steps it's really you know to me it's really crucial to get the proper research um, you know proper model of how it's going to be structured first before I actually sit down and start breaking things down and kind of designing the app, the app itself or the or the system itself so but when I get into this stage and I have a lot of ideas and I have kind of a wire flow of how that information is going to be structured then I start to first of all that's something that I feel is missing in a lot of the processes and that's inspiration I've spent uh, a year inspiration uh, doing a concept art course on a an Australian um, Academy it was it was a school for concept artists and you know other people involved in the in the gaming industry etc and um i've done a concept art course so um you know it was all about building concepts for games and movies so designing props and helmets and axes and you know all that craziness that you can see in the games and what was really interesting for me that listening to some of the senior designers and seeing the senior concept artists you know the amount of reference they're using to create these great concepts you know and um, that's something that really inspired me into pursuing the path of inspiration and getting as much um, references or as many references for our design work as humanly possible. Because, um, you know, you can, you can only create so much out of your own visual memory that you have, you know, stuck somewhere, you know, stuck somewhere in the, in the midst of our, you know, brain structures. And um, it's just so, did more, you know, so, so much more difficult when we're trying to force that design out instead of kind of looking for inspirations. And I constantly look for inspiration anywhere. You know, it's like I'm on the airport. Well, not lately, but when I am on the airport, you know, I look at the banners, uh, the commercials being displayed, you know, what some cool concepts when it comes to, you know, features, designs, uh, so some interesting elements that, that somebody came up with. And yeah, I just photograph them and kind of put them together in my own mood boards. And um, yeah, and they're somewhere left in the backbone of my yeah of my <laughs> you know, in the back of my head and i can always go back to them uh whenever i need to so and it's, it's the same goes for my pinterest page you know it's like packed with hundreds and hundreds of boards and structured in some format 
uh, for, for for the inspiration because I'm, I I love looking at other people's work, commenting on it, and yeah, kind of you know appreciating uh, what what others have done. Uh, so I can actually leverage some of their um, elements into my design. So so that's the inspirations and uh, and that's the the first step in the whole UX design. Once I've done the modeling and I've done the research, then I can sit down and start to kind of inspire myself with that. So so that's that. Once I've created the inspiration, then we can go into straight into uh, what I like to call prototyping, so kind of creating an interactive prototype, but the interactivity is pretty slim. So I start with a paper prototype. Paper prototype. And um, if you'd like to see some examples of, of, you know, of all of those elements, definitely reach, kind of, you know, give me a shout out. I'll be, you know, I'd be happy to share some of those or at least show you you know how to actually tackle this but we will be tackling this every week now so i think that we'll go into each one of those steps and kind of highlight it and then just you know keep on going because i think this program is going to take us a few weeks to actually get and cover each one of those aspects so so that's that so a paper prototype is basically taking the, the stuff uh let me just take maybe uh, this one taking the stuff out of the the wire flow um and the inspiration and kind of starting to put a little design on a sheet of paper together so that you know it kind of highlights some of those elements there's something there that like a header or a footer you know maybe something there like a little main pie chart you know and i just start to put these ideas to work but very quickly uh using the inspiration i found and the wire flows i've, we, we, I've put together using the information architecture and then just trying to come up with something that starts to evolve into a concept into a very early concept that is on paper. So there's a few benefits to doing that. You know, if you do the, if you do that on paper, you're not committed to it because it's on paper. You know, it's pretty draft form. So you can always get rid of it. But you know, the cogs start to work and you start to imagine things, and and it actually you know speeds up the process pretty dramatically. So uh, I'm gonna get rid of that, and just to keep it neat. There we go. So paper prototyping, that's the first stage into, into, into this whole thing. Then one, this one, one, once I have some something on paper, like a few uh, paper prototypes, I usually put them on the wall somewhere so I can look at them, look at the entire information architecture, kind of the, the wire flow and see how it kind of corresponds with the paper. And it's like, okay, it kind of makes sense. I can already see, you know, how the user is going to be interacting. Uh, in between all of these kind of, you know, very rough uh, screen designs or very rough app designs, whatever that is. And then, yeah, and then I go into the next steps. So I bring it or I take it to the next step when it comes to the quality of that uh, specific element. So um, that's a something that, that we call a low fidelity prototype, a low fidelity design. So this is something I'll already start in a digitized format. So that'll be maybe something... Uh, in Sketch, in Figma, in um, you know, in Adobe XD, something that's already digital, something that you know has a form and some substance to it with, with some pixels. So, so that's where I really get into that stage. And then, once I've done a few iterations of you know making sure that that low fidelity prototype or that low fidelity design is actually something I comprehend and I, and I like it and it starts to work, then I go into high fidelity, high fidelity design. And I'm sure that there's a lot of people watching this like why why you should go and test it out with the users yeah and we will uh, i'll just i'll show you the connectivity in between each one of those because there's a few ways of actually doing um, an early on validation of all the concepts here and the low fidelity design is definitely uh one stage where we can validate some of those ideas really early on so so that's that let me just move it a little bit further up so that we can all see that all right that's cool. So high fidelity design. And then that's when we have, then, then once we have the high fidelity design ready and we're happy with, you know, we put all the typography, the colors, the branding and all of those elements that, you know, iconography and illustration and just make it, you know, beautiful. Then we can go to uh, the next element, which is um, interactivity. So kind of interactive prototype. And the prototype is obviously being built for one specific reason. We want to kind of make it interactive so we can actually present it to someone and then test it out before if our concepts within that prototype actually make sense to them. You know, if it's something that they're happy with, 
uh, using and yeah, what are the problems and pitfalls? What what have we not considered yet? So so that's the interactive prototype. And to me, that's kind of that where the UX design kind of UX UI design element kind of finishes uh, before we move on to the to the next uh, to the next stage. And that is let me just go and that's uh, to the next one. And that's UX. Some people kind of call it uh, usability engineering. I'm just going to call it so we see this UX everywhere. Uh, I'm going to call that UX testing. UX testing. There you go. And that's the gist of this whole thing. So that's UX testing. And that's where we come up with, uh, that's where we come up with everything related to validating that this interactive prototype actually makes sense to anybody watching it or anybody using it. And that's where we, yeah, put together some, again, testing scenarios. We already know who we're going to be recruiting because we've done that work previously in our UX research stage. So we kind of invite the same people over or the, or the same profile over just to test out that what they've told us as far as their problems and their needs are concerned are actually being solved with the prototype that we've created. You know, So we've done all the design work and now we can validate it so that the problems that those people told us about actually are being resolved with our cool prototype. So that's something we need to start off with. So we need a testing scenario. And the testing scenario is a list of tasks that we give to those people so that we make sure that when they are using the prototype, those ideas that we've put together actually work, you know, make sense to them, etc. So uh, obviously those tasks are associated with the problems that they've highlighted at the very beginning of the show. And um, yeah, so we're trying to test if those, uh, if those problems corresponding to a specific task is being resolved uh, through our design. So that's testing uh, scenarios. Testing scenarios, there you go. So that's uh, that. And then once we have those testing scenarios, we can do the user testing. So I, I don't want to get into all that detail of what that is and how to run it because we will be covering all the details so, um, in our future lives. So user testing. So this is where we take our beautifully designed prototype and we put it in front of a real human being with a real human person, <laughs> human person in front of a real person. And we're, yeah, obviously, usually that prototype needs to be on the basis of the testing scenario. We need to kind of structure it so that the, the data works, that the process of the task actually makes sense, that there's the right information there. Uh, because when you're designing it quickly, you know, sometimes, you know, a date gets misspelled or something. And you just make sure that, uh, that these prototypes are interactive enough and that they kind of correspond with the tasks that we're asking the user to do. So then we do the user testing, and yeah, and at the end of the day, we um, testing, we, we synthesize it. So testing synthesis, which is nothing more than a list of recommendations that we give to ourselves, the design team, uh, you know, to the business, what didn't work, you know, and, and what we recommend should be changed uh, within this specific step. Uh, or within this specific task or the element of the app or what kind of information is not readable or visible or usable to the uh, to the end user. And that's, uh, my dear friends, pretty much it. At the end of the day, also, there's one additional step that I like to put together. Uh, I'm going to call this very roughly uh, UX engineering. And I'm sure again, there's a lot of um, misconceptions. There's a lot of everybody has their own, you know, three, three little, little consulting circles. Everybody has got their own terminology. But what what I mean by UX engineering is, you know, kind of playing the role of uh, of a developer, of of, of something, of someone that needs to create that uh, prototype and kind of turn it into something that, you know, is is real and tangible. And I'm just gonna write one thing here, and that to me is the UI specification. Maybe a little bit more specification. So how does that uh, interface we've designed actually works from the perspective of the developer? So if you do have a drop-down list, what is on that list? Why is it there? You know, if you have an input field on the form, you know, if you type in three symbols, we start to validate it in line, etc. There's a lot of you know crazy details that go into this at this specific uh, step in time. So. These are the elements that we specify as designers, you know, with the with the right context, so that people that want need to implement whatever we've designed it 
have all the responses to, the, to their questions. And so this is just the one that I would include so that we don't forget that we're not just doing a prototype, we're making the prototype to implement it, you know, into the into the service, into the product, etc. So that's that's pretty much it. I'm going to go back into this uh, pinkish one. Uh, so we have the wire flow. Then we take that wire flow. We go into UX design. We have the interactive prototype. We take that interactive prototype and kind of stick it into the testing machine. And then one, then then once we have whatever we've tested and we have some some synthesis, we can then uh, making sure that all the recommendations have been fulfilled we can then go into the next stage. Sometimes also with the last iteration of testing, when we've tested the last version of the prototype, for example, we can go straight into implementation with the last list of recommendations because this is something we can catch uh, during the implementation. So we don't have to go back every time uh, or the final time to the, to the prototype and redo it and then give it to the guys to implement. We can actually use that last step to actually create the list of recommendations and implement those into the actual dev uh, DevOps or the, the yeah the, the development operations. So so that's that. Now using my pink color, I'm gonna highlight uh, the very beginning of of our endeavor from last week. And as you probably remember, we've defined that UX design. Uh, let me just draw it nicer. UX design. Okay, okay. There you go. 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 So what that actually was, let me just move that a little bit further. There you go. Okay. So we've well, what we said UX design is is seven elements, right? So the first one was the technology. I'm actually going to use a different color. Just bear with me. I'm going to use this pinkish, our 19 and grit pinkish color. There you go. And that's um, so that's the technology. So that's the first thing that we as designers need to kind of consider, take into consideration and um, kind of, you know, adapt. And, and that's very closely connected to the creative constraints. But let's let's keep on going. So technology, resolutions, uh, you know, hardware, software kind of limitations we need to consider. So technology is number one. Then we go and we have the information architecture. So how do we organize architecture? How do we organize the information so that it's structurally understandable to whoever's looking at it, right? So that's being the librarian of, 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 of the data, right? So how do we organize those books? How do we make sure that it's, you know, that it's, um, uh, that it's making sense to people? So information architecture is one thing. And um, hello, Jacek. Hello, my dear brother. Thank you for the question. I will respond to your question very shortly. Just bear with me. So um, information architecture. Then we have information information design so once we have structured the information properly now it's all about how do we best present it to the user you know how do we make sure that okay it's organized it's structured properly so it has a structure that's understandable to people now how do we design it or how do we present that information in the best way so that it's understandable and this is the most usable way of using the data and deriving the information out of it right so it's not just the structure it's how do we you know, what kind of tips and tricks we're using to actually present it better. So that's information design. Then we go into the next one, which is interaction design. So now we have a organized information presented in a beautiful way, but with no interaction. So now we add that interaction, right? With interaction design. So that's that. And then once we have that interaction design, we can then move into do, do some, you know, do some do some damage as far as the kind of uh, usability testing is concerned. Um, and depending on you know where we end, where we kind of kind of end up, you know, this can be at this stage. But it's just what UX is; it's not the process itself. So that will be usability, or I'm gonna actually use that. Let's do it usability testing. Usability testing. basically talking to the user and, and finding out what they need what they see working what they see you know not working etc so that's that and then second to last is the ui design so this is the uh you know using the branding the 
visual aspects of color, typography, all those crazy visual elements, illustrations, iconography, you know, just to make sure that it's nice to look at as well. So it's aesthetic, not only pleasing from the perspective of structure, but also from the perspective of the visuals. And at the end of the day, this is, there's another one and that's called copywriting. So this is all of the written form that's within our little app and everything that we communicate to the user verbally. So kind of all the written words, uh, typography, how do we structure the paragraphs so that they're usable, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what UX design is. And this is what UX design process looks like. So if we zoom out and just do that, there you go. What I wanted to highlight is how do those kind of intertwine? How do those, um, yeah, fit together? Um, so let's just use this pinkish color and I'm gonna go with maybe a little bit more of a sizable chunk, there you go. And how does this fit together? So when it comes to the technological aspects, to me, all of the technological aspects kind of sit over here in the creative constraints as well as the UI specification. So these are the creative constraints, the screen resolutions, the elements related to, um, you know, what kind of device we're designing for. Is it the desktop or is, is it the mobile mobile, mobile computer, which is the, the, the mobile phone, or is it a tablet, for example, or is it all of them? You know, we need to do a responsive web design kit or, um, you know, and we need to design something that's responsive. And Again, that's, that sits right here in the creative constraints, something we need to find out about very early on. And then once we have designed all of the you know, crazy features, we need to come back to it and specify exactly to the developer, you know, to, the, to the person implementing it or to the company implementing it, how we envision that this should work, not just look like, right? So that's why those elements, as far as the technology is concerned, kind of sit to me in those two elements. Then we go to the next one, that's information architecture. And that's very closely um, kind of combined or connected to the UX modeling, to, to, to this stage of the process. And there is a specific element called information architecture and the wire flow. So how do we organize the information? And then how does the process of kind of going or putting that information together into a wire flow? So how, how does the process of the user through our app actually looks like at a very high level? So what kind of information are we going to be giving to the user um, depending on what kind of element in the process within our entire kind of spec uh, they end up? So that's information architecture and that's where that kind of sits. I would say that also information architecture is, is relevant to even the paper prototype or the low fidelity design because that's something we do kind of comprehend when we're structuring the information together, you know, to overwhelm the user, give them the right information at the right time. So that's something I would um, I would do. Just bear with me, I'm just gonna use a different layer for those highlights. There you go. Uh, and actually I'm gonna use it maybe, no, let, let's leave it at the 19 and grid purple. So technology, that's creative constraints and UI spec. Then information architecture, that's our information architecture at, on UX modeling wire flows, some of the paper prototype and the low fidelity uh, design as well. But to me, uh, the low fidelity and paper prototype correspond closer uh, or very closely to the information design. So once we have organized the information and modeled it properly, we can then design a way to actually visualize it the best way possible. So that's where the inspiration comes in, the, the paper prototype, and probably the low fidelity design as well. So that's that. Then we go into interaction design and that's where we kind of end up with you know interactive prototype and as you remember probably uh some of you might think that you know the low fidelity design is good enough to actually make it interactive and test it out and i fully agree we can go from low fidelity straight into interactive prototyping and then go and test it out very early on and do it many many times uh, but that's you know that's something we can you know decide upon once we are in the actual process so that's when it comes to uh, interaction design. So the interactive prototype, um, everything related to user testing that's very closely connected to the interactivity of that, uh, of that specific app. So that's um, that. Then usability testing, and that's everything related to UX testing. So the testing scenarios, the user testing, uh, the testing synthesis, all of those elements relate to the usability testing as well as everything that happens in the UX research stage of things. So we were using very similar methods very early on. So we do talk to some people, you know, with 
our in-depth interviews with our um, online questionnaires probably. You know, we provide uh, or create user scenarios. We define recruitment profiles. We do a lot of these things uh, related to uh, to the usability testing stage of things. So basically talking to some real people, to some real users. And with this specific process, we talk to them very early on to validate some of the hypothesis and some of the hypothetical concepts. Then once we've designed it, we do it again. So that's in the UX testing and the UX research as well. And then we go to UI design, and that's very closely connected to the high fidelity design, obviously, uh, to the inspiration, obviously, and everything related to our ideation as well. So we came up with these crazy ideas and we covered them within our inspiration, within the high fidelity design sometimes, and, and all the other kind of parts of UX design as well. Uh, going back to usability, um, testing also, the stakeholders mapping is very closely connected to that as well as value proposition um, as well. And then we go to copywriting, which is the last kind of element. And that's very closely connected to, uh, to high fidelity design. So that's something that we put together um, when we are either at, sometimes even at the paper prototyping stage, uh, definitely at the low fidelity pro design and high fidelity design as well and creating the interactive prototype and that's something that, that i've mentioned even in the user testing and testing scenarios once you, once you come up with a few uh, testing tasks for a specific prototype to be tested against we need to come up with some yeah diverse um, communication with the users it, it cannot be lorem ipsum anymore it needs to provide valid information so that, so that the concept that we actually validate makes sense to the user right so that's as you can see, we've covered the technology, we've covered the information architecture, information design, interaction design, usability testing, UI design, and copywriting within each one of those. Uh, right? The, the technological aspects and everything related to kind of how the technological constraints correlate with the process themselves, that's something that's what a UX design is. And to me, what, what an add-on of the process is are these business goals and the business model that we actually look at from the UX perspective, so from the user experience perspective to make sure that what the business people come up with is actually relevant to the user. So that's uh, pretty much a, a check of what a UX design is and what the UX design process is. And I'm just gonna go uh, and kind of highlight that. What UX, uh, bear with me, UX, or let's just do, UX design and this is going to be kind of the, the structure of UX design or kind of um, um, the components. Ah, that's what I was looking for, components. And this is the UX design. Design process. So what I'm going to do is get rid of those um, of those highlights, but I probably need to yeah, highlight those bad boys, move them to the next layer, get rid of this. There you go. And maybe the colors as well, so we can actually see how beautiful it all looks like. So to sum up, we have the, the UX strategy, which starts off with defining the creative constraints, business goals, outcomes. Then we validate that business model, whatever value proposition we came up with, with the UX research early on, talking to some people, uh, defining that we're in the right spot and our concept for, for this app system, whatever, actually makes sense and hits the spot when it comes to the problems we're trying to solve. Then we start to model things. So we ideate, we uh, generate or organize information and we create a, a high level wire flow. So kind of a process of how did a how the design is going to be structured from the perspective of that user. Then we do UX design, so we inspire ourselves. We do a lot of prototyping all the way from paper all the way to a finished interactive prototype. Then we test that prototype at the UX testing stage. And once we're done with all of the iterations, because you need to remember that there is a possibility or a potential of doing um, a lot of um, iterative work, right? We can go back and change things, right? all the way from engineering even from the ui spec go back and kind of redo something uh, because it's all iterative so i'm just gonna go iterations there you go and that's pretty much the gist of this whole thing and that's how we go through the process 
And yeah, we end up with a finished product that we go and, and implement, supporting the developers, supporting the people implementing it, and making sure that, you know, as UX designers, I believe that it's not just about doing wireframes or, uh, or doing research. You know, we need to cover each one of those aspects of the process to make sure that we are having a proper impact on what the product is and what the service is going to be in the future. So if we are able to start at the very beginning with the UX strategy, then do some proper UX research, go through the, the, the design process, model it properly, design it properly, test it out, and then give it away to the implementation. Then we're really mitigating the risk of the business investing you know, resources into something that doesn't work. If we just design something without the validation with the users, and that's pretty much it.